So we're going to go ahead and get started, even as people are coming in, just because we have an hour and um, it goes by really quickly. So welcome to um, a Substance Misuse Prevention and Supports, a two-day virtual summit of strategies for schools. We are so happy that you are here with us. We know it's a crazy time and there are competing priorities as we are beginning to get back to school and or not get back to school or whatever that looks like wherever you're at. And so thank you for being here with us. Just to go over a couple of um, housekeeping things. Um, we are going to all be muted and stay muted. And if you have questions, put them in the chat box. Um, this is a keynote, so we're gonna kind of see if at the end uh, we have time for questions and then we'll be able to, if we have time, answer them. If not, then we'll definitely capture your questions and put it in some, some sort of document and have Kelly um, either point you into the direction of the answer or provide the answer herself. The evaluation link is posted if everyone can see that. If you can fill out the evaluation link um, at the end, that will be great. All resources are loaded up onto the Google link that you also see there. And so you can go ahead and click on that and um, whatever resources that any of the presenters or, um, have, or keynotes have provided for us will be uploaded on to there. Am I missing anything else? Um, we're going to be using the hashtag Connecticut Prevention. If you have any ahas throughout the day, um, go ahead and share using that hashtag. Our first speaker today is going to be Kelly Perales. Let me just. Hold on one second. Who I'm happy can join us. She's one of the first people we reached out to when we. Um, we're developing the conference, so we're happy that it worked out to have her here today. She is the co-director of the Midwest PBIS Network. She's a licensed clinical social worker and has both worked as both a school employed and community employed clinician and administrator. She's facilitated the implementation of PBIS and the integration of mental health and social emotional behavior systems within schools. So she'll be talking to you today about integrating substance misuse prevention and supports into your um, tiered systems and collaborating with community partners um, to do that and what she's done in her role. So welcome, Kelly. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Bianca, I think you have to stop sharing so that I can share my presentation. Okay. All right, thank you for having me here with you today. As Bianca said, my name is Kelly Perales and I am co-director for Midwest PBIS Network. We are a regional hub of the Center on PBIS which is a technical ass assistance center funded out of the U.S. Department of Education Office of Special Education Programs. I actually live in South Central Pennsylvania near Hershey. And uh, today, some of the data I'm gonna show you has to do with substance use and abuse in the Northeast. Uh, and you'll notice on some of the maps that Pennsylvania uh, and Connecticut and other Northeastern states are all uh, together in, in the data set that we're going to look at. Uh, the first thing that I do want to do is to uh, provide some acknowledgments. Uh, John Seeley is a content expert out of the University of Oregon around this work. Together with uh, Sean Austin, they have uh, helped to develop some of the uh, recommendations and guidance around substance use prevention uh, and addressing misuse in schools. And so we have collaborated on uh, the content and I do want to acknowledge their efforts in uh, the presentation for today. I also want to acknowledge uh, our current reality. Uh, I certainly feel like educators across this country have had uh, the most challenging summer of all summers as everyone has prepared 
for multiple plans for the start of the school year, which may end up changing uh, rapidly and changing again. Uh, and so whether you are working in a school or you are a community partner who is supporting interventions within schools, I certainly think that we should just start with uh, a deep breath and honestly acknowledge how we might be feeling, whether that is um, anxious or scared, whether that is stressed out and overwhelmed. Uh, we need to really honor that uh, this pandemic has impacted all of us. And in order to be able to support students, especially with challenges like substance use and abuse, we have to be able to support ourselves and one another. And so I just wanna put a little bit of this work into context. Uh, again, in our schools uh, across the country, there are lots of things that are on the minds of teachers and administrators and other leaders. And certainly you can see that things like vaping and opioids and substances are within uh, the multitude of other competing worries and priorities right now, especially as we start what will be uh, a very different school year, unlike any other. And so there's lots of words that have been used to describe that. Uh, but really what we're gonna talk about today is how a multi-tiered system of support, and I'm gonna use PBIS, Positive Behavior Intervention and Supports, as an example of a multi-tiered system of support, can be continually relevant, even in the constantly changing educational landscape. Today specifically, uh, the problem of practice that we're going to talk about is substance misuse prevention and responding to substance use and abuse, particularly within education. There is some data that I'm going to share with you now to sort of set the stage for this problem of practice. And again, you will find references here for all of the data that I'm going to share with you. Uh, I want to just spend a little bit of time on the data because I really want to get into what does this mean to us and what are the strategies and the takeaways that you can have out of our time together today that you could go back to um, your school and district and begin to develop action plans around. All right, so to set the stage, uh, here you can see these are opioid prescribing practices. And you will notice that among young people, uh, this data is from 2017, particularly ages 15 through 24, there's over 10% of young people who've had opioids prescribed to them. And even more importantly, this data from 2016 shows that young people as young as 12 years old uh, have self-reported using illicit drugs in the past year. If you look at data across the country, you can see, and this is where in the picture, uh, those of us living in the Northeast, there is self-reported prevalence of heroin use by children as young as 12 and also cocaine. And so we have the highest prevalence here in the Northeast of young people self-reporting the use of heroin and cocaine, according to this 2016 data. Again, you can see here uh, the same age categories of uh, self-reporting use of prescription drugs that are not prescribed to them. So um, they're getting the medication maybe at home from a parent or grandparent or other family member or even purchasing at school prescription medication uh, that again was prescribed to someone else and they're purchasing it from a peer. Here's some data around non-fatal overdose hospitalizations and emergency room visits. Again, looking at uh, the prevalence among young people, you can see that uh, all the way up through ages 24, that it's higher than any other age group. Uh, for trips to the emergency room and non-fatal overdoses. If you look at, again, the data across the country, you can see, once again, the Northeast has the highest prevalence 
of non-fatal overdose hospitalizations and emergency room visits. If you want more information about this data, and again, data is usually um, behind when it is reported because there has to be an opportunity to collect and aggregate and interpret the data. But if you go to the Center for Disease Control, uh, you will see a 2018 report and can get some additional information about the prevalence of substance use and abuse. So let's shift gears now and talk about how this impacts young people in our schools as well as their families. Again, what we know from the data is that young people are at high risk and report, you know, again, this is self-report use as early as 10 years old. And these children have the greatest risk for heroin, heroin use later in high school and of course, we know that peers highly influence individual risk among young people. We also know that young people are coping with traumatic experiences. There's been a lot more over the last few years about the impact of trauma and adverse childhood experiences on young people. And frankly, at this time in our country during this pandemic, uh, during the social justice uh, unrest that we have, there is even a greater impact uh, and risk for young people around trauma. And so this impacts their uh, potential risk for the use of opioids. There is also the impact on families. And so uh, this could be young people living in homes where a parent is addicted to substances uh, and they may be separated from the family either to go into a hospital or a treatment setting or to be incarcerated because of legal trouble stemming from substance use and abuse. We know that young people are then sometimes put into kinship care or foster care and uh, we also know that for adolescents, there could be separation from family if they are in treatment or incarcerated. And so the impact on families of the opioid crisis is uh, very high and certainly carries over into the school environment. And so how do we begin to address these concerns in our school systems? Certainly, we want to rely on the public health prevention framework. And, you know, certainly there's been a lot of attention in the media lately about the public health framework because of uh, the public health crisis that we have in our country around uh, COVID-19. And so uh, oftentimes the public health pyramid or triangle is depicted to help us think about how to address primary universal prevention, secondary targeted uh, intervention for those at risk, and then tertiary or individual intensive intervention for those who are affected by the public health crisis. I wanna stick with this theme of pyramids or triangles here for a moment. Uh, and bring in the Maslow hierarchy of need. Uh, in March, schools made a quick pivot as uh, the World Health Organization declared a pandemic for COVID-19. And essentially schools closed, communities closed, and we all began to shelter in place. What we know is that schools provide a sense of safety and security, they provide food, they provide other essentials for children in our country and had to quickly pivot to how they were going to support children in their homes when it might have led to an increase in abuse or neglect. It might have led to an increase of um, food insecurity, homelessness, um, especially for families who lost their jobs and their income. And uh, there are also the inequities around access to the internet. And so schools quickly pivoted and had to scramble to think about how to help families meet the basic needs for young people. And this um, focus on 
paying attention to basic needs will continue as we start this next school year. The next triangle that I wanna show you is um, the way in which we organize our multi-tiered system of supports in schools. This is true for academics, and it is even more uh, critical that we pay attention to this uh, framework for the social, emotional, behavioral, mental health, and substance abuse needs of our young people. And that is to say, we have to think about what we need to do for all students, and all staff and all families across settings. So that's homeschool and community, and that's um, however school is going to look uh, at the start of this school year. We also need to be able to identify and uncover those students who are at risk and may need some type of targeted uh, or tier two intervention. And that's usually delivered in a, a small group and so if you think about in academics for reading, there are gonna be uh, students who don't respond to the general reading curriculum and are gonna need extra support, perhaps in small group instruction for reading. Then we know there are going to be about one to 5% of students who are going to need those individualized, more intensive interventions. And so in our reading example, that might be individual instruction with a reading specialist. If we think about behavior, we know that about 80% of students are going to respond to our expectations or the rules within a school. We know that about 5 to 15% are going to need extra support, small group instruction, reteaching expectations and rules, practicing those, and receiving additional feedback from teachers. And then about 1 to 5% are going to need additional support. The same logic applies if we're talking about internalizing concerns like depression and anxiety or the impact of trauma. And the same logic applies if we're talking about substance use, both prevention as well as intervention. We are learning more in research, and so the literature speaks to why we should use a multi-tiered system of support to install any practices within our school. Uh, we know that a multi-tiered system of support is essential for accurate, durable, and scalable implementation. It gives us a framework grounded in that public health model of prevention and provides a continuum of evidence-based practices and the use of data for decision-making. It also can more efficiently support identifying students who are at risk and who need to be connected to higher level interventions. And so whether you're talking about social emotional learning, how to address trauma in schools, or our topic for today, addressing the opioid crisis, we want to use the multi-tiered system of support. And so here you can see, uh, and this comes from McIntosh and Goodman's uh, book that they wrote on integrating multi-tiered systems of support. Whether we're talking about academics or if you call it PBIS, if you call it MTSS for behavior, there are core features that we really want to hone in on to address those social, emotional, behavioral health needs. And so the reason I'm using PBIS as an example is because we have over 21 years of research and evidence to tell us that PBIS reduces problem behavior, increases academic performance and attendance, improves the perception of safety in schools, including reducing bullying behavior, improving organizational efficiency and reducing staff turnover, increasing perceptions of teacher efficacy and improving social emotional competence. More recently, PBIS has been demonstrated not only to improve student and teacher outcomes, but also to reduce exclusionary discipline and be perceived to create safe, predictable, equitable education environments. 
we have expanded the notion of traditional positive behavior intervention and supports, which in the early 90s really focused on an emphasis of acting out problem behavior in schools. We know now that we were missing an entire uh, cohort of young people who not, were not sent to the office for problem behavior. Uh, instead, they might have been suffering in silence in classrooms. These are children who have what we refer to as internalizing concerns. Again, those children with anxiety, depression, uh, have been impacted by trauma and it's manifesting in school. And so most recently, and really for the last uh, 10 years, we have expanded the ideas of PBIS to encompass mental health, substance use and abuse, and have been referring to this idea of an interconnected systems framework where education, mental and behavioral health and substance abuse uh, systems coalesce together to create a single system of delivery uh, to address all needs of young people. And so the ways in which we have uh, enhanced the multi-tiered system of support is to have teams that include community partners, to expand our data from discipline, attendance, and grades to other data, such as nurse visits in our schools uh, for those children who have somatic complaints, uh, counselor referrals, or those students who seek out social workers, psychologists, and school counselors to look at data from our community, not only on the prevalence of substance use and abuse, but child welfare involvement, juvenile justice involvement, uh, families who have risk factors like homelessness and food insecurity, um, what protective factors are in your school community, and how do we have a process for selecting evidence-based practice that is based on what we know about the needs from that database uh, of home, school, and community. How can we identify through universal screening those students who might be struggling with mental health issues or at risk for substance use? And once we select an intervention, we want to make sure that those who will be delivering the intervention have the professional development that they need, as well as ongoing coaching and technical assistance. And we want to progress monitor outcomes regardless of if the intervention is delivered by someone employed in the school or someone employed from a community partner agency such as mental health or substance use. And so if we think about some of the recommendations for addressing substance use and abuse in schools, and we use this logic of the expanded multi-tiered system of support, we want to acknowledge that using a multi-tiered system of support such as PBIS, according to the literature, provides a positive, predictable, and safe environment from a study done in 2015, it does reduce the rates of substance use in high schools. And of course, that's when done well. It has to be implemented to fidelity. And it can provide us with a structure for successful integration and adoption. And so that is speaking to that now expanded multi-tiered system of support of an interconnected system, which again emphasizes a single system of delivery where we can identify and connect young people to appropriate interventions, where we're not only monitoring did a young person get connected to an intervention, but what outcomes are we seeing? Is there an impact of that intervention? And is there transference and generalization across home, school, and community? And so we wanna use those core features to integrate mental health and substance abuse services. That needs to be led by a district and community team who includes members who have authority to do things like change policy if necessary, change funding structures if necessary, and change the way people spend their time so that we can free up people with expertise to deliver interventions of high quality. 
we need to think about the initiatives that we have in our school and align and integrate where possible. And on our teams, let's make sure we have someone with expertise, uh, perhaps a licensed alcohol uh, drug abuse counselor or a certified alcohol and drug abuse counselor. We want to eliminate any perceived barriers that lead to the integration of our effort. And sometimes, um, just quick example, that means if a certified uh, substance abuse clinician is going to be part of a team, they're not going to have an identified client to bill for that time. And so how do we change a policy or funding structure if necessary to allow that person to be part of a leadership team? We also want to make sure that we're providing resources and uh, education to families and community members to uh, reduce stigma and help uh, them realize why we need to prioritize things like substance use prevention. When we expand our data, again, we want to not only get student perception uh, and their own self-reports around substance use and abuse, but other data such as family prevalence, community data about substance use and uh, misuse and abuse looking at data trends and thinking about the connections between mental health issues and substance use issues. We certainly know that there is comorbidity between the impact of trauma or mental health challenges such as anxiety and depression and the use of substances to uh, sort of cope or self-prescribe uh, you know, the ways in which people are dealing with those issues. And so how can we get better at using our data for decision making? And once we have a sense of what the prevalence or needs are, we need a process to select appropriate evidence-based interventions that are going to match the needs. We know that evidence-based programs for addressing opioids are limited. We certainly know that there are um, in the literature these, uh, this idea of using kernels. And so, for example, um, I'm, I'm just going to stick with anxiety for a moment here. Um, there are evidence-based interventions for anxiety, yet we're not going to be able to have um, our clinicians and schools or even the community get trained in every evidence-based intervention that is available. Um, that's uh, really resource intensive. And so we instead want to see um, what are the kernels, the common themes, the skills taught across evidence-based interventions that we could draw from and perhaps teach those in a small group for kids in schools and still get some desired effect. The same is true when we're talking about opioids and uh, substance use and abuse. How can we draw from problem solving and evidence-based approaches to, to drill down to the skills that can be taught for young people, especially in schools, that they can transfer and generalize across settings. And so um, from the National Implementation uh, Research Network, or NERN, the hexagon tool, which is the, the diagram you see here, is one way that school teams um, uh, have a process for selecting an evidence-based intervention, whether it's at tier one, two, or three. When we're talking about social emotional learning, again, the recommendation is let's not do that as a separate standalone intervention in schools. Let's not have SEL skills taught on Monday and substance abuse prevention taught on Tuesday and PBIS lessons taught on Wednesday and your trauma informed on Thursday and your restorative circle on Friday. We have to get more efficient, especially now more than ever, in aligning and integrating all of our social emotional behavioral health interventions. And we want to focus on what are the skills that kids need to address this whole range of concerns. And so certainly there are uh, some evidence-based social emotional learning curriculum that also are evidenced for substance abuse prevention. And so you're gonna need to think about in your school or district, what's gonna be the best match to meet the needs in your school. So here's a quick example. These are two schools within the same district. Now. 
Sometimes in a large district, there could be a school on one side of town that has different data than a school on another side of town. Sometimes you're going to have different data in an elementary school compared to a high school. Sometimes in rural communities, you know, the data is going to look the same across schools because um, you're a small community. But in this example, you can see that the data in school A is different than school B. And so sometimes, even in the same district, we have to contextualize our response and we have to contextualize where we're going to intervene. Because in school A, where they have higher rates of discipline issues, higher rates of students who have been identified at, as, as at risk in the universal screener, they're going to need to do something for all kids. General rule of thumb, if you have more than 20% of your students in any one category of data, you should be dropping down an intervention and doing something for all kids. And so if you think about the logic and compare school A and school B and their data, school A is gonna need to install some things at tier one to address substance misuse and social emotional behavioral needs. Where school B, and I'm just gonna go back for a quick second, ha who has a much lower rate of problem behavior, students who are meeting with clinicians individually for intervention, students who are identified at risk on a universal screener, that school is probably gonna think about, let's boost what we're doing at tier one. So in other words, what we're doing, let's do it well, let's implement two fidelity, and then add a small group intervention at tier two to address some of those data points. And we always want to be sure that we're monitoring both fidelity, are we doing what we said we were gonna do, and impact. Are we seeing our data for students trend in the right direction? In other words, um, are we seeing problems decrease and uh, appropriate pro-social and coping skills and problem-solving strategies increase. Let's talk about families for a moment. We know, and again, now more than ever, we need to authentically engage and partner with families in all aspects of our young people's lives, whether that's academics or social, emotional, behavioral health, and substance use and misuse. misuse. We've got to involve them in prevention and treatment. We've got to educate them. We've got to uh, help decrease stigma. We need to provide opportunities for caregivers around uh, helping them with uh, whatever it is they might need now. And we've got to contextualize for uh, the current state that we're in. You know, this slide says after school activities. I don't think there's going to be after school activities right now. There might not be in-school activities right now. And so how can we partner with families who might be at home with their children and needing support? There are resources available online. There's an e-book for family engagement um, and a Family School Community Alliance. And you can get more information about that uh, on our website. There are certainly uh, some resources available through the Department of Education. You will find resources, fact sheets, um, other information about school-based curriculum online. And again, we've got to educate everyone about these problems so that we can come together in order to impact them. When it comes to screening, um, I've mentioned universal screening. I will say just one more thing about that um, for the purposes of today. Yes, we recommend universal screening in a multi-tiered system of support. If you're not already using a universal screening in your school district, this is not the time to start that process. There are already a multitude of priorities that you're going to be thinking about with the start of this next school year. Yes, you want to think about how to screen and identify in an informal way students who need additional support. However, 
thinking about beginning a new initiative, a new process, a new protocol uh, seems like an overwhelming challenge while we are uh, still in the midst of a public health crisis. And so here, uh, what this slide is referring to is once you have identified kids who might be at risk for substance use and uh, abuse, then you want to layer on kind of in this gated process, a specific screener around substance use and abuse. And so in some schools, especially at the secondary level, this might be something you do for all kids, depending on your community data. It could also be something that you do for a small targeted group of students after some sort of uh, kind of universal uh, screening process or that informal screening that you might do during this time. Tracking fidelity and impact. Again, we wanna be looking at both the system and the interventions that we're gonna be using across tiers. And so if we're tracking the fidelity of our systems, that might be something like the ISF implementation inventory. If we're talking about interventions, we have to be thinking about how are we gonna monitor when we start the intervention, uh, whether we know we're implementing it with fidelity and what data point can we identify before we start the intervention that we're gonna monitor while the student is in the intervention? And that's true across tiers. We wanna make sure again, that everyone receives professional development. That is true whether we're talking about mental health or substance use and abuse. So how can we make sure that we are increasing the confidence and competence of all staff in schools to recognize mental health and substance use and abuse needs, and what should they do about it? What can they address in their classroom, and when should they ask for help? How can we make sure we're following up with ongoing coaching and technical assistance, both for all staff and also for those who will be delivering small group and individual interventions? How can we partner with experts in the community to provide consultation as well as help deliver those more intensive specialized interventions? We also want to make sure that we have an emergency protocol for uh, any type of a crisis that comes up. If there's an overdose on campus, if there's an overdose in a home while students are in virtual or hybrid learning, what is the plan that you have in your school community for addressing an opioid overdose or some sort of other uh, problem in your school community? Okay, I'm just gonna pause now. I want us to also contextualize this for returning to school. And I want to share with you, I know that early in March, our inboxes were flooded with resources from lots of places with good intentions. And yet, I don't know about you, but I couldn't filter through all of those resources. And so now some time has passed and we can think more strategically and specifically about the resources that we're gonna use to start our next school year. And again, I acknowledge that you all have been working on these plans and reworking these plans and the plan you have today might change by tomorrow. It might change by this afternoon. And so uh, I wanna just share with you a few resources that we have available on our website um, you will notice that one of them has been co-authored with other partners from national centers across the country. That guide has been uh, divided into sections for elementary, middle, and high school. And you will find some very practical uh, suggestions and recommendations. And here is, are just a few. The bottom line is we want to get back, back to basics. We need to do what works and do it well. We want to pick a few things and focus on them. 
as I said, this is not the time to add additional uh, initiatives, curriculum, uh, or you know, practices that we're not going to be able to implement with fidelity and monitor uh, our data. Instead, we want to reteach, remind, and acknowledge your school wide expectations. And that includes whether you are going to be in person in the classroom, in a hybrid setting, or have full virtual instruction. You're going to need to have classroom routines for all three of those options, knowing full well that you might have to change the way in which your env environment for education is set up throughout this fall. We want to focus on the positive and avoid punitive approaches. You're going to have to get to know your students again. Again, some students who did really well in school have struggled since the beginning of this pandemic. Some students who had challenges in school have done better as they've been able to be home and participate in school virtually. So you're going to have to spend time building those connections and relationships. You're going to have to find ways to identify students who need more, including giving them some sort of signal or strategy so that they can reach out for help if they need it. And again, we have to re-engage families as partners in education so that we can authentically identify and support those students who need something more. The other uh, suggestions that I wanna give you in summary, and then I think we'll have time for a few questions, is that substance misuse is complex, it's multifaceted, and especially challenge with, challenging within our schools. We want to use our multi-tiered system of support to structure the way that we respond as adults, to structure the way we select and install and implement programs that address our data and our needs. We want to leverage resources in our local communities and partner with experts who are trained to address these complex needs. We want to teach relevant skills to aid in substance use prevention. And again, engage families early and often, and especially more now than ever. And so at this time, I just want to, before we open it up for questions, thank you for all that you are doing to meet the needs of your school community. And I want to thank you for taking your time today to join us, especially when there are certainly competing priorities uh, as you begin to open up your schools, however that looks for this school year. I do want to say that although we'll be able to take a few questions, um, as Bianca said, we will develop some sort of FAQ or document to share after our time together. And in the next breakout, I will be joined by Mackenzie uh, Harrington, who will give an example of how this can play out in schools. She will speak to some of the concepts that I have shared during this keynote and give you a real school example. We didn't have time for that today, other than the quick little snippet I gave you about uh, using school data. Uh, but she will give you an example and we'll have more time for dialogue and discussion during that next breakout. The last thing I just want to share is my email address. Um, again, I pointed you to our National Center website, pbis.org, our Midwest website, which is midwestpbis.org. You will find resources there for substance use uh, and abuse prevention and intervention mental health integration, alignment and integration of social emotional behavioral health in initiatives. You will find recorded webinars and uh, technical assistance briefs and uh, other presentations that we have done. So I thank you for your time and I saw there was lots of activity in the chat. So I'm really eager um, to take a few questions at this time.
Bianca or Amanda, do you yeah. want to maybe share a question that's I, coming up in the chat? So, so Kelly, I remember one, yeah. sorry, I was trying to quickly grab yeah. all those amazing resources <laughs> that you were sharing and put them into the chat box. So that was probably the craziness you saw going on. Okay. Um, thank you. There was a question early on when yeah. you were sharing data mm -hmm. um, about the young, um, young children who had hospitalizations. And there was a question around a wonder statement if that was due to accidental um, like use or um, something like that. So the if you could speak to the the young group of um, children right. who might have access. Right. Right. Again. Yeah. Certainly, uh, a part of that is children who maybe have swallowed pills that they've gotten a hold of uh, in a home. But again, remember, children as young as ten and twelve were in that data category, and so we shouldn't make the assumption that it's all by accident. Uh, so I don't want to overgeneralize there, uh, because we know that there are children by their own self-report who are uh, gaining access to um, prescriptions that aren't theirs or uh, illicit drugs and ingesting those. And then a question I have that I was hoping uh, maybe you could speak to a little bit is, um, you had mentioned having community organizations or supports be part of a school team and yep. sometimes the barriers around that. Um, any suggestions around how we can work around some of those barriers to include members of our community health organizations, or our local prevention councils yep. um, to be part of those teams? Sure, sure. Great question. Uh, absolutely. Um, really the recommendation and the guidance around that is, first of all, reaching out to those organizations. Uh, sometimes we're surprised at uh, the fact that our community partners are eager to join us uh, in schools and be part of our teams. Uh, they just really aren't sure sometimes how to go about that. Um, the other piece, if there are barriers such as, and I gave the example of um, someone can't be part of a team because, um, you know, unfortunately in behavioral health, whether that's mental health or substance abuse, um, oftentimes the model is fee for service. And so, uh, you know, sometimes there's that kind of funding barrier. And what we have seen to be successful is when we kind of take that up the cascade of implementation. In other words, um, what are the policies and how is the funding structured and what changes can we make? And so we have to get um, funders, whether that's managed care or however state structures are set up, um, or, you know, your Office of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services in your state um, to, to shift the policy. And in order to do that, we have to kind of get to the what's in it for them. Why should we do that? And frankly, what we know is if we invest in this notion of a single system of delivery where uh, clinicians and, and experts in substance abuse and mental health can be part of the team, we're more likely to address issues early on, right, with prevention and early intervention, and less likely then to have kids who are kind of bubbling up to those more restrictive, intensive uh, interventions that are expensive. They're expensive um, for educators, and they're expensive in the mental health substance use um, system as well. And so uh, there's value added and return on investment and so that is the way in which we can get funders and policymakers to, to make those changes. And we do have examples of that uh, in some other places. Um, and again, we, we could share more about that uh, or you could find those resources on our website. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any more questions or comments? If, can we get this up? If not, then um, Kelly, can I just have you unshare? Because I just wanted to go yep. over. Um, I'm going to just share with the participants kind of the schedule for the rest of the day and for tomorrow really quickly, just so that um, everyone's on the same page. I know that you received it in an email, um, but I just wanted to, to show you what we have planned. For the day. So just give me one second while I share my screen here with you. Make sure that I share just that. <laughs> um, here we go. Can everyone see this? Yes. Yes? Okay. <laughs> so as Kelly mentioned, she's going to be presenting next 
with um, her co-presenter Mackenzie and they'll be doing a district example, kind of doing more of a deep dive into what she um, talked about in her keynote. You also have the option to attend Dr. Chasnov's breakout. Um, so there's only two, two options, Kelly's and Mackenzie's or Dr. Chasnov's. And he'll be going into educational strategies um, and for promoting learning and achievement in the classroom. So that is going to be the next one. Then we're going to have an afternoon keynote, Sarah. And Sarah's going to be kind of combining her personal story of hope and resilience, and then also evidence-based practices for making connections um, on mental health and substance use issues. And then the later breakout from two to three um, will be um, Amy Grasso, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and she's going to be going over simple, brief, and engaging classroom interventions um, and adaptions to the virtual online learning platform. So that's going to be our day today. Again, we know you have lots going on. You can attend one, all, um, whatever works best for you. Tomorrow, we're going to be back here at 9 a.m., and we're really excited about this keynote by Dr. Chasnov. He's going to be talking about COVID-19 stress in your classroom and what we can expect in the fall and impact on the stress on learning in the classroom and online. Um, and the breakout tomorrow, just to go over, is going to be ESPERT, the Screening Brief Intervention Referral Treatment. Um, it says adolescent girls and opioids because they'll be focusing on that, but really it can be used for, for everyone. And you have the choice between that and secondary traumatic stress. This is the self-care part, right, which is really vital, um, especially in the environment that we're in and taking care of students by taking care of teachers. And so we're excited for that one as well. And then we will have a lunch keynote by, there's no option tomorrow afternoon. You just have this one by Dr. Jackson. And this is gonna be really bringing equity into the conversation when we discuss substance misuse and prevention. And she's gonna be talking about creating a culturally responsive environment. And then the last breakout will be Dr. Alfie, who also works with Dr. Jackson. And we're really excited to have her. She's been doing some of our lunch and learns that we've been having around opioid use and prevention. And she's going to be talking about conversations with adolescents and entry points for intervention. So that's kind of the layout for the next two days. You should have all received this information with the links to it. Um, if not, let me know if you did not and we can resend it to you. Reminder that the evaluation link um, is up there as well. If you can please fill that out, that will help us develop future content and trainings and let us know what we're, well, how we can do better. Um, or what else you need or are looking for. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. It was so a pleasure. Much. We're happy that this happened. We know we've, there's been a lot of adapting and going back and forth and changing dates. So thank you everyone for joining us and we are looking forward to seeing you in the next breakout. Thank you.